Pastor Dan Meyer writes, when I was five years old, I was sent to the school nurse by my kindergarten teacher. She was very concerned that I was ill. The school nurse concurred with my teacher's opinion. My face was flushed, my core temperature was elevated, so my mother was called to take me home. What no adult seemed to see, however, is my outward condition was simply the result of an inward secret. He says, underneath my school clothes, I was wearing a one-piece fleece flannel pajama suit, a pair of tight, tidy whitey underpants over them, and a terry cloth towel for a cape. The heat came from the fact that underneath my mild-mannered exterior, I was a superhero. Well, he says, a lot of us begin our lives that way. Beneath our ordinary exteriors at the start, there beats a passion to do something extraordinary. No kindergartner, when asked what he or she wants to be when they grow up, says, someday I want to drive a minivan and clean the house and go to a job day in and day out and hopefully retire early and work on my golf game. He says, if your kids are saying that sort of thing, pull them off their medication immediately. And if they're not medicated, you might want to look into it. Most of us, when we start our journey, have dreams of doing something super, doing something extraordinary. We want to fly high, right wrongs, leave a mark on this world. But people flock, I think, to see superhero movies, partly because kind of the excitement and the thought of, what if I were transformed like that? Remember as a kid, Spider-Man was my favorite. You know, this kind of nerdy kid, Peter Parker, he wasn't cool, he wasn't strong, and then suddenly he's bitten by this spider, and he becomes all these things can climb up walls, amazing strength, and, you know, just the excitement that these superheroes have. You know, we today even realize we need heroes. We need those who will stop looking after their own interests and care about what others do need. Those who will rise above temptations and trivialities. We know how badly our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our churches need them. Where's the one who will redeem what's gone wrong, who will set straight what has been broken? That's why we keep looking to the sky. You know, as kids, we often think, someday, I'm going to do great things. You know, teenagers and those in their early 20s often make promises with their friends of the amazing things they're going to do someday. But slowly, the cape comes off. Life presses in around us. Day-to-day -day requirements weigh on us. It's hard to defy gravity. We begin to recognize that there is much about our character that is far from heroic. We can't seem to leap over our own bad habits and ingrained sinful patterns, let alone tall buildings. We can't seem to outrace the demands of our schedules and the consequences of our actions, let alone stop a speeding bullet. If we ever had a body of steel, some of us did many years ago, it begins to change as you grow older. It breaks down, and we no longer have the strength of the superhero. As the cape slips off, we start to look for other things that can help. Maybe we'll turn to medicine or science. Perhaps we'll be able to overcome our mentality through doctors and through new drugs. Maybe our imperfections through genetic engineering. Social ills through better education. Surely humanity is moving on an upward escalator. Or maybe stuff will save us. I mean, how many commercials show someone who, you know, looks a little down on earth, and then they're given this thing, and suddenly their life... But that's what we're shown. So we begin to think redemption can be found at Costco or, or Target, or maybe even during the 36 hours of Amazon's Prime sale, not just 24 hours, 36 now. That's gonna save me, and I don't even have to leave my home to do it. Well, maybe we think it's gonna come from the sky. Our help will come from above. Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer, author, and speaker, hoped and said that he believed one day an advanced race would come to Earth and, as he put it, teach us the laws of development of civilization that will enable our society to evolve. Do any of these approaches to salvation seem like they worked for you? Those who have studied history note that our scientific knowledge, our schooling, has not brought about the utopia we once hoped for. I mean, the reality is in this day and age there are so many more ways to die than there used to be. In this day there's accelerating fragmentation. And as helpful as free enterprise is, our capacity to buy more and more has not led to happiness. Japan, an incredibly wealthy nation, the suicide rate is astronomical. The United States, a wealthy nation, very high suicide rates. Stuff has not led to happiness. 
Can we afford to wait for a spaceship to come teach us a better way? To create a capacity for heroic living that goes deeper than just pajamas? Well, 3,000 years ago, the psalmist asked that question that all of us must ask. When in Psalm 121, they wrote, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? And then the writer goes on to say, goes on to give the place of help. It says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And if you've read the Bible, that is what it's about. The story of God coming to rescue broken humans. You know, the New Testament starts with Jesus, born as a baby, being held in his mother's arms, who eventually would hold this world in his arms. As an adult, he stretched those arms out on the cross and gave his life that we could have life. So we don't need a superhero today. Spider-Man or Superman or Thor or Wonder Woman or, you know, name the ones you like. We don't need them because Jesus came. So we read in Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Why do we need a Savior? I think many Christians would say, yeah, I'm, I was, I'm sinful and you know, I need God to help me. And, and that's absolutely true. We need, do need his help. But it's worse than that. It's bigger than that. What Paul's making clear here in this passage is that without a Savior, we're not in dog's God house. I'm sorry, we're not in God's God dog. Wow. Flip, flip. We're going to repeat that. We're not in God's dog house. We're actually in the morgue. Because without Christ, there is no hope. Paul uses two words to describe the behavior that leads to spiritual death. The first word is translated transgressions here, trespasses in some translations. It's a word that means a false step, to go off a path, to slip, to fall. As used here, it could mean deliberately wandering off the path and trail, or it could mean inadvertently doing it. The word sin comes from an archery term, meaning to miss the mark. As used here, it's a picture of failing to, to hit the target. We're missing God's standard for our lives. Now, this is both sins of commission, things we deliberately have done that we should not have done, that have displeased God, but also sins of omission, those good things that we should have done and knew we should have done, but we failed to do. Well, our sins do not just make us sick. They cause spiritual death. So why is it such a big deal that we're dead and not just sick? Well, something that's sick can get better, right? Maybe some medicine or maybe some time to rest. Something that is dead, you know, that's, that's the end. It's not going to suddenly recover. Before God entered into our lives, we were completely unable to respond to him in any way because we were spiritually dead. We were spiritually dead and we needed a Savior. When a person dies, his or her body begins to decay immediately. And without Christ, our lives are on the path of just decaying until the end. Since we're spiritually dead and there's not a thing we can do for ourselves, we need help. And so Paul continues by talking about what we were like before Christ came into us. He says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins when you followed the ways of this world. So this world is, is kind of the society around us. It's what we are taught. You know, what are some of the things as Americans that we're taught to do? To take whatever you can get, right? If it feels good, do it. <laughs> Put yourself first. And we see that mentality lived out in our television shows. We see it lived out as we're just walking around town. <clears throat> Yesterday, my wife came home from ShopRite. She had gone grocery shopping, and she said, Mark, you are not going to believe what happened. She said, I was heading the cashiers right there. She said, I was going straight on in. And a woman came from the side and quickly came, and she said she literally used her cart to knock mine out of the way. And she went in front of me and took my space. Well, she said the people around were kind of looking at Deb like, what is she going to do? And uh, after I said, lady, don't make eye contact, I kind of did it, and then you know, just went in. And thankfully, Deb said, you know, that morning she'd spent time reading her Bible and really spent some good time with God. And she had also listened to praise music on the way, so she just simply looked at the lady's huge cart piled high and went and found another line. 
But she came home and she's like, what would make someone do that? Who does that? That's what our world teaches, you know? Take what you can. The bottom line is that lady just saved herself five minutes because she didn't have to wait for death. That's what our society teaches. It's okay. But Paul's saying here, the world leads us down this path of sin. Well, also he continues, he says, you were dead in your sins when you followed the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Talking about Satan, about the devil. Now, Satan, as I've said before, unfortunately our society has done us ill because we picture Satan as this guy, he's, all, he's red, got some horns, right? Cloven hooves, big long tail fork. I mean, he's this, you know, come on, that's like a cartoon creature. So it makes people go like, come on. The Bible says Satan is an angel of light. He's smart. Like, Satan doesn't give you a bowl full of maggots and say, like, ooh, look what I could give you. No, he tempts you with those things that, that you love. And what tempts you is probably different than what tempts me. But he knows what will get us, and he pulls us down into sin so that we miss the mark, so we fall off God's path. But lest we blame it all on the devil, as some people like to do, well, the devil made me do it. Verse 3, Paul says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Now, the flesh is who we are. It's our sinful nature. And he says here that we gratify the cravings of the flesh. We followed its desires, its thoughts. We're not victims. We make these conscious choices to do things we know we shouldn't do. And so at the end of verse 3 we read, like the rest, we were by nature as deserving. We were by nature deserving of wrath. See, we think we're good enough for God. The Bible teaches the opposite. We're all flawed. We have all missed the mark. Sinning and hurting ourselves and others. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve to be eternally separated from Him. We try to transform ourselves. We try again and again. We try to, to direct our lives. To fight off the old, the old man, who we used to be, the flesh, the sinful nature, the world, the Satan. And yet we fail again and again. You know, even those who have fame, fortune, find its pull, and they realize eventually that this world does not have what they're looking for. Celebrity chef, writer, and TV personality, Anthony Bourdain, who had a tattoo on his, on his arm in ancient Greek that said, I am certain of nothing, committed suicide five weeks ago at the age of 61. In an interview in Men's Journal from a few years ago, he was asked, what are the benefits of living life seeking to please yourself, and what are the risks? Bourdain replied, look, I understand that inside me is a greedy, gluttonous, lazy hippie. I understand it. There's a guy inside me who wants to lay in bed, smoke weed all day, and watch cartoons and old movies. I could easily do that. My whole life is a series of stratagems to avoid and outwit that guy. I'm aware of my appetites, and I don't let them take charge. Well, then he was asked about regret. How do you handle regret? He says, regret is something you've got to live with. You can't drink it away. You can't run away from it. You can't trick yourself out of it. You can't just, uh, he says, you've got to just own it. I've disappointed and hurt people in my life, and that's something I have to live with. You eat that guilt, and you live with it. Well, clearly, eating his guilt wasn't enough. It didn't take care of whatever was going on in his life. Clearly, the regrets were there. You know, our old sinful nature wants to kill us. It wants to destroy us. Now, this has been a pretty uplifting message so far, don't you think? Like, you know, well, there's good news. Because now we get to a but. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So that word, but, the first three verses, bad news. We're lost. We're hopeless. We have no hope. We have no chance. You know, it's kind of like a kid. If your parents were to say to you, you know, like, I am very upset and you deserve to be punished. The kid's kind of cowering, right? You say, but. Ah. But we've decided not to. Or but we've, you know, that's what we're hoping. That's what's happening here. Bad news. But now we're going to shift to the good news. 
It says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. The first he talks about his great love for us. His love is amazing, beyond belief. Now, the Greek here, it actually uses the word love twice. What is translated with us with just one use of the word love literally says, because of the great love with which he loved us. So it's emphasis through repetition. God's love is amazing. It's so big. God's rich mercy, we're said, is rich. It's over the top, overly generous. And because of God's love and mercy, we're made alive. It takes us back to verse 1. Remember, we were dead in our sins. We had no hope. But because of his great love, it says we were made alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. God did this. You see, Jesus came to offer the gift of eternal life. Verse 6 says we're raised with Christ. If we receive Christ, then we will spend eternity with him in heaven. If, he is, if we are one of his children, then we will be with him. And that's our hope. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we've earned. This passage is so clear. It is God's gift to us, not something we could ever deserve. God, it says, expressed his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then we come to the very famous verses, verses 8 and 9. I would encourage you to memorize these. These are powerful words. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's really simple. Salvation is by grace through faith. What is grace? It is unmerited favor. Grace is something good that you don't deserve. It's when you deserve for your parents to punish you, but they don't. It's when you're loved, even when that person should have rejected you. It's when you're forgiven, even when they should have held on to it. Because it was so awful. Didn't, you, you don't deserve it. That's what grace is, and that's what God gives us. His love is amazing. So God's amazing grace, though, must be received by faith, is what we see here. He freely offers the gift of eternal life, but it says it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And through faith is not just like, man, I just hope this is right, boy, I'm just, I'm just. Now, faith is putting your complete trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, as the one who can rescue you. You know, the problem, though, is many of us think we're good enough. Most Americans, when asked, believe they're going to heaven. The vast majority of Americans who believe there is a heaven. I'm not talking Christian, kind of anyone. They believe in heaven. Are you going, yeah, why? Because I've been a good person. You know, maybe I go to church a couple times a year. I give occasionally. I help some people out. Maybe I go every week. And I give all the time. I help a lot of people. But we think we earned it, that we deserve it. And yet this passage is clear. Verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. You know, the problem is if we could do it ourselves, we'd be so proud. Like, yeah, look what I did. I got myself saved. I gave myself salvation. No. It's a gift of God. The problem is, some of us have a hard time accepting gifts. Some of us have a hard time feeling, you know, someone does something for us, we feel like then we need to do something for them. In other words, we need to earn God's love. And that's why the importance of grace, his unmerited favor, is so important for us to understand. My wife is someone who has a hard time receiving gifts from others. She is more someone who'd rather give. She feels badly if someone does something for her. You know, she's one of, she just, some people are like that. I'll be honest, I'd much rather be married to someone like that than the other way. But, um, you know, the truth is that if someone does something really nice, say, oh, what, I need to do something for them. That's not how life's supposed to work. You don't have to. But she feels that way. Even this week, um, she has a foot issue. It's a, called a neuroma. It's this nerve pain. And um, Tuesday, she went to see a podiatrist. He gave her a cortisone shot, some instructions. And Thursday, she texts me. I'm here at vacation Bible school already. I say, Mark, I'm not going to be able to come. She said, I'm in real pain. I can't even walk. I don't even know how I'm going to drive home. And so, uh, you know, I just let her know, hey, I'm really sorry. And a couple hours later, I see a text coming. I'm still here. And she says, I know it's Thursday vacation Bible school week, and you're exhausted. And, but I'd really appreciate if you could go to the store and get me. And she had some things the doctor had suggested. You know, and the way she said it was like, you know, boy, Mark, I know this is really a lot, but you know, I texted her back, like, I'm your husband. I love you. Of course I'm going to do that. Like, 
it was no big deal. And I did go into the store, I will say, um, she needed a couple of different foot type of inserts. That'll take no time at all. But first of all, finding where they are in these stores, like, you know, it takes forever. And then once I found it, I mean, the section, I'm not kidding, it was like, like 30 choices. And so I'm reading her text and looking, reading her text and look, I found some for high heels. And, well, that looks, no, but that's not, that effect still never, never get high heels. So that can't be it. You know what? When I went home, what I said to her was, I spent a lot of time working for you, woman. <laughs> yeah. No, I get home, she's like, thank you so much, honey. I'm like, Deb, it is not like, I was happy to do it. She's my wife. I love her. Friends, God loves us. And he does not expect us to earn his love. We can't earn his love. Now, the truth is, if we love him, if we're children, we should want to do what makes him happy, just like I want to do what makes my wife happy, because I love her. But we don't earn it. Verse 9, not by work so that no one can boast. So if you're someone who's here today and you're like, no, I really don't need that whole grace thing, I'm doing pretty well, that's not what the Bible teaches. So, God has not stopped giving his gift. And the world is not <laughs> hungry for what Christ offers. We don't need a superhero. We already have a Savior who came. But the gift must be received. And so in closing, I want to ask you three brief questions. Are you willing to surrender your life to Christ? If you've never given Him your life, are you willing to do that? That's the first step of giving Him who you are. Of asking Him into your life. Does God have you where He wants you? Are you at a point where you realize... You're not a superhero and you can't do it all, that you need him? Are you willing to confess to God that you've done wrong? You've missed the mark. You've sinned. Are you willing to ask for forgiveness? Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, but it's a gift that must be received. And will you receive that gift of eternal life? Will you ask the Savior to come in and live in you and reorder your life? Forgive your past sins, renew your present character, and then reorder your future. And then finally, will you trust God with all of your life? Will you give all that you are to Him? So, some people want Jesus, but they also want a whole lot of other things. It's one of the struggles of those who come from a Hindu background. You know, Jesus is my God, but He's one of my gods. The Bible is clear. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No person comes to the Father except through me. Are you willing to give him all that you are and all that you have? The great news is this. When we give him our lives, he plants his spirit in us. The spirit of Christ, the Bible calls him the Holy Spirit. And this spirit comes and lives in us to help us to become who God has called us to be. Friends, there's bad news. We are flawed. We are sinners. We do wrong things. Our society doesn't like the word sin. You know, okay, you insert your word. It's the same thing. We do things that we know are morally wrong. But God in his grace offered a Savior. Will you receive him today? Please close your eyes. If you've never asked Christ into your life, if you've never made this step, I would invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. Pray it silently. God hears your thoughts. He knows your heart. Just pray it with me now. Dear Jesus, I thank you for giving your life on the cross, for willingly being willing to forgive me of my sins. And Jesus, I admit I have fallen short. I have done things that are wrong, and I ask for forgiveness. I ask for you to make me clean and for you to make me whole. Jesus, I hand you my life. I offer you who I am in exchange for who you are. I invite your Holy Spirit into my life that you may begin to guide and direct me, that your love would always be in me, and that your grace would be evident always. I thank you. I know I don't deserve this, and I can never earn it. And so I thank you for the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. Please keep your eyes closed. If you pray that prayer for the first time, I'd ask you just hold your hand up. Keep it up for about 30 seconds. I want to know to pray for you. Also, I'd love to get you a Bible. If you pray that prayer for the first time, thank you. Others, please raise your hand. Just keep it up. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 
Father, I thank you for the gift of eternal life through Jesus. And I pray for those who today have received you that they would know how deep and amazing your love is for them. Father, that they would know that you care about them. I pray for those here today that are just not ready. They're not convinced. Lord, speak to them. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that you're re real. I would ask you to reveal yourself to them. And Father, for those of us who've already received this gift, help us to not just begin to treat it like it's something small. It's easy to take it for granted. Jesus, help us to never do that. May we live our lives in love to you, in gratitude, not trying to earn your love, but simply giving love to the one who loved us first. And Jesus, we'd ask and pray this all in your name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing about his amazing grace.